John, normally when we think about the relationship between music and the brain, we're trying to figure out why we understand music and what, what is it in the brain that enables us to, to appreciate music. I'd like to try to turn that around and say, because music is such a powerful part of human emotions and human feelings, can we use music as a probe, as it were, to understand our mentality? Absolutely. And as a scientist studying music in the brain, I'm very comfortable actually putting things in those terms um, because we really need a reason to study music. Sometimes people view music as this optional, freely thing that's just about emotions and so on. But no, you're absolutely right. Music can be a powerful window into the brain because it touches on so many different functions. The obvious ones, you mentioned emotion. Um, we've got perception, perception of pattern. We've got movement, you know, the fine motor skill needed to create create music or to dance. Mm -hmm. So really, if you think about any, any basic me mental function, music touches on it. So there's a growing, quickly growing field of neuroscientists and psychologists using music uh, and its various qualities to help us understand how the brain works. One area is really using music actually as a foil for language. Music and language share many structural features mm. in terms of having hierarchical senses and rules and so forth. But music's a little easier to understand. The, the elements are, are simpler than language. So people are using music as a window into just linguistic processing, for mm. example, syntactic mm. processing. In my case, we're using the fact that music has timing to start to understand how the brain understands time in general. And the idea that we're being led to is that the way the brain understands time is not just through listening, not just through the auditory system, but it's through interactions between the auditory and motor systems. And what I mean by that is that when we listen to rhythm, um, the motor system makes a critical contribution to how we actually understand that rhythm. So a typical experiment that we do might be something like this. We take an ambiguous rhythm, like a swing pattern. Um, and we ask people to tap their foot along with that. So let's just do it. So most people would tap it on that second note. So mm -hmm. da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 mm -hmm. okay. But a really interesting thing about people and particularly musicians and percussionists who are trained on this is you can turn it around internally. and You can actually imagine the beat falling on the first note. So, da, 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 da. It's a little less so, natural. A little less natural. Um, it's got a little more of a uptight yeah. martial feel to it, yeah, whereas yeah, the other one yeah. is like a swing pattern. All right, all right. But it's entirely possible. So we can use the brain's ability to do that shift to start to try to understand what is this internal sense of pulse or beat. Um, it's always a challenge when studying the brain to study something that's entirely internal, right? How do we actually get a handle on that? When do we know, you know, when an idea occurs? How do we know when the beat occurs? What in your mind, you know, how do I know where your sense of beat is? So using this trick, we can actually ask people to essentially look at the same rhythmic pattern from these different perspectives. That's very nice because you're controlling all the variables, the same number of beats. That's right. And the same, the same relationship of the beats is just which one is, is uh, emphasized ra rather than the other. Right. So the physics are identical. The, yeah. the same sound waves are reaching the brain. Right. But like, a necro cue, which is that 3D wireframe cube that you can see is either kind of coming out of the page or receding into the page. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing with these rhythms. And so that gives us in a way, if we study the brain response to those physically identical sounds, but yet knowing that you're perceiving it with the beat on the first or the second note, which are very different. Which internally feels very different. Feels very different. And that, to me, is the most exciting kind of powerful okay. thing about this. All right, so you got me excited. Shape. What do you see? Yeah, what do you so see? What we see we see that the brain cares, obviously. So when we look at the brain responses to those two different interpretations, yeah. they're different. Okay. How so? We found that the way that the auditory system responds to those two tones actually marks where the beat is. The response to the, the tone that coincides with the beat is actually larger. When you say larger, you're talking about the amplitude of well, EEG waves? Or what, so, what, what? Yeah, so we're using EEG or MEG, which are both uh, techniques to study quick events in the brain. Um, from a very kind of distant large scale. These are both techniques that measure the, either the voltage or the magnetic field right. around the head right. that reflects currents flowing inside neurons. So we're getting a, 
bird's eye view, but we can easily identify auditory responses. We can see that the brain responds to each sound, for example. So in particular, there's a frequency band. Um, you can think of the brain as providing a whole spectrum of, of activity from low frequencies to high mm -hmm. frequencies. And these have been named historically for different Greek letters. So there's an, a, a band called the beta band from 15 to 30 or so. Hertz. So yeah, the EEG waves. The EEG waves. Fifteen. And any place in the brain, not just auditory. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, well, they, they, it actually predominates over certain parts. We've got these beta waves that are oscillating from fifteen to thirty hertz, and so it's actually those beta waves that we see have a greater amplitude, mm -hmm. coinciding with the note that corresponds to the beat. Okay, and that, together with some other brain imaging using fMRI, which is a way of looking at patterns of blood flow in the brain, which gives us a picture of what parts of the brain are active. The brain imaging has shown that the motor system is active while listening to rhythms. So that, coupled with this idea that the beta power of the EG signal is, is modulated by the sense of beat, led us to the idea of thinking, well, maybe it's the motor system that's actually providing that top-down modulation of how the brain is responding to sounds. So we would basically say that it's your motor system, regardless of whether you're moving or not, which is informing those different feelings of those two different sounds. So the alternative would be that in some way the 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 uh, emphasized beat would 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 be uh, apprehended at a lower level mm -hmm. and then just reflected all the way up just in a linear simple pattern. That's yeah. the alternative. The alternative might be something purely auditory yeah, that purely we've got auditory, right. maybe an auditory memory that or you're imagining that that first beat you know, it, the downbeat is louder or something like that. Um, and we know that there are sort of metrical accents in music that right. do have these. So you could argue for a purely auditory right. view of things. Um, as it goes up the chain. As it, it goes it, up the chain, kind of a, you know, it's, it's marked right. early on right. and then gets interpreted in fact, that would be by the, some higher system. That would be the default way of thinking about it. You know, it's, it's the way that I think historically we've I mean, thought about the brain yeah. is this ascending right, kind of right, sensory right, right. motor loop. Okay, right? so now you're introducing a, 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 an interesting and radical idea that the, 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 the reason that the, you see the bigger amplitude on the beat in the auditory cortex is not just something coming from a below, it's actually, but it's coming from an equivalent, a, a sister part of the cortex yeah. in the motor area because, yes. because the physical movement is an important part of the structure. Right. So you call this a beat-based perception, I think? We call this beat-based perception. So this mm. idea that we mark certain moments of time as, as being more important than others. So does this mean that, that uh, broadly that uh, our I internal sense of time is somehow related to this same fundamental idea of rhythm? Because we, we all have an internal clock, we call it. You know, some people can wake up at a certain time oh, right, without right. a clock. I mean, we, we all have different yeah. kinds of rhythms inside. And we, we all have a sense of time as it, as it flows. Sometimes it's faster if you're sitting on a, you know, a radiator since forever. If you're <laughs> with your girlfriend, it, you know, it, oh. like, it, 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 yeah. it seems like it's very short. Uh, so we all have internal mechanisms of, of, of time, and, and what your claim is is that, 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 that some of the fundamental reasons that we have that we appreciate music, that those same fundamental aspects of rhythm and, and timing form our whole sense of time, uh, very much broader than our just appreciation of music. Is that right? Uh, so, uh, you know, I go we, too far. Well. <laughs> Time, there are many kinds of time, many kinds of rhythm in the brain uh, and in our world. I mean, you talked about circadian rhythms, for example. Yeah. Um, I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about rhythms in the sort of sub-second to second range. Okay, and, and those particular rhythms, we believe that there's this critical interplay between the motor system and the auditory system for helping us mark those times. Um, yeah, to a drummer, the idea is really simple. You know, we know we mark time with our bodies, right? Tapping our foot or clapping, making music. So we know that the motor system is able to create, you know, very intricate patterns, temporal patterns. Okay, so why not, you know, have the brain use that? It's somewhat teleological, but if that signal exists in the motor system, why not make use of it? Okay. Um, so in our research, we've been looking actually now at responses in the auditory system, responses in the motor system, using a, a slightly different paradigm where we can dis distinguish responses to sound and responses to this internal sense of beat. Um, we've shown very clearly that the sound responses are in the auditory system and that the beat-related responses are in the motor planning area. And the, and the beat-related responses are, are, are not in the auditory system, the, the way you so, said it? 
so in this in this paradigm, so the the key for this this new experiment was that the beat and the sounds are not occurring at the same time. Oh, okay, because oh, oh. we you know usually sound and beat occur at the same time. It makes it a little difficult to distinguish those two in the brain. So right. what we've done is is basically decoupled those. How do you do that? Beat. Well, if you think about a syncopated rhythm, okay, so a, a non syncopated rhythm, we just like. Right. That defines the beat, and all the notes are on the beat. Right. Well, syncopated rhythm would be something like. So you see that there's yeah. that little jog. There. Right, so right, if you right. maintain that sense of beat, it's you know beat, beat, you're, beat, you're beat, yeah. beat yeah. right? So by doing that, we can look at well, is there something in the brain that's actually marking that beat, even if there's no sound? Oh, oh, I see. I so see. is there something in the brain that's keeping track of where the beat falls, oh, even though the, it didn't occur even because it it's wasn't syncopated? The sounds. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we found that in the motor planning area, it's keeping track of that. Well, that makes sense because I have an internal, when you're doing that, I have an internal sense of where the beat is. Yes. And right. and and it wasn't, and you didn't clap on the beat, right. but I, and I knew that, so it has to be represented. It yes. didn't come out of yes. the air. Of course, and, and and it's not a big surprise to think it might be represented in the motor system, because <laughs> right. that's how we, that's right. how we externalize right. the beat. But what's different about this is the idea that the brain is actually making use of that timing information mm -hmm. to shape your perception. Because you, mm -hmm. you said yourself that when you heard those two different interpretations of that swing pattern, it felt different. Yeah, it did. So really, this is the question yeah. I'm looking at. It's yeah. a question of meaning. Yeah. What does a note mean? Well, what a note means is is essentially where it falls in time relative to your internal sense of beat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that I'm arguing is what makes that those two rhythms feel different. It's because they relate in a different way to this motor potentiality, to this this motor planning, this timing.